to Data and Society. My name is Rebecca Wexler. I'm a former fellow here and a current affiliate. I work on data technology and criminal justice issues. And it's my pleasure and honor to welcome you here for the final night of three Wednesdays, where we're featuring this year's uh, cohort of fellows to talk about their work. So now for our first speaker, Veronica Avila, I'm going to introduce her talk, A Recipe for Better Restaurant Industry Workforce Conditions. Veronica is a labor, right, labor rights organizer and researcher. She is currently the campaign co-manager with the Restaurant Opportunities Centers United, ROC, which is a restaurant workers center that's committed to improving wages and working conditions for the nation's restaurant workforce. Prior to her work in research, she was a labor rights organizer. She organized with several service worker unions and the Chicago chapter of ROC. So welcome, Veronica. So I work with the Restaurant Opportunity Centers United, and as the name implies, we're actually a sector-specific worker center. Um, so we focus on improving the workplace conditions in the restaurant industry. And while we are primarily composed of restaurant workers across the country, we actually have offices in about nine different cities across the country. Um, we have 25,000 restaurant worker members, but we also really make it a point to engage different stakeholders that obviously have the capacity to shape uh, the well-being of the restaurant industry and implement uh, models to profit that are what we call high road. Um, so we also work with uh, employers. Um, we work with about 750 employers across the country. Uh, they comprise a network that we call RAISE, uh, which is a beautiful acronym. I can't remember what it stands for, but it's something about raising the industry standards. Um, and then we also have a consumer roundtable that's called Diners United. Uh, one of the ways that we know change happens in the restaurant industry is through the powers of consumer demanding change in the workplace. Um, so I want to maybe start the talk by focusing on why Rock exists and why Rock uh, focuses on the restaurant industry and why you should care about the restaurant industry. Um, the restaurant industry is actually one of the country's largest and fastest growing industries. Uh, there are about 14 million restaurant workers across the country. Um, in New York, it's over a million. This is one of the largest restaurant industries in the country. Um, and we also uh, know that the industry is incredibly profitable. Um, so we know that recently there was a shift in the way that we eat. And in 2017, uh, people started to dine out way more than they ate in their homes. So that caused a boom in the workforce. Um, we also know that the industry is incredibly profitable. Uh, so every year, the National Restaurant Association, which is the corporate industry trade lobby of, of the restaurant industry, uh, releases projections on like the state of the industry. And this year, they project that there will be about $863 billion in sales in our industry. And that's a 3% increase from last year's sales. So it's thriving, it's enduring, it's growing, it's a source of employment for so many people. Um, oh, yeah, there. I missed the slide. So uh, it's actually also the source of the majority of new jobs in the country. So in 2017, uh, or I think actually maybe 2016, uh, this industry had what represented about 10% of the new jobs that were created. Um, so it's, it's just booming. And I'll get into that more and why that matters. Um, but I actually wanted to ask people, has anyone here ever worked in the restaurant industry? Raise your hand if you have. Okay, so that's kind of reflective. Um, about half of the country at some point in their life has worked in the restaurant industry, and that actually is even higher for women. About 60% of women at some point in their life have worked in the restaurant industry. Um, uh, so while you know, I've just sort of laid out that the industry is booming, it's growing, it's really profitable, sales are increasing, it's also a really perfect nexus of inequality. Um, unfortunately, even though sales are booming, they're growing, uh, this is also the industry that houses some of the lowest paid jobs in the country. So eight out of 10 of the lowest paid occupation are tip roles, and I'll get into what that means in a sec. Um, and nine out of 20, oh sorry, eight out of 20, uh, nine out of 20 of the lowest paid occupations in the country are restaurant jobs. So this industry also houses the percentage, or the number of workers that earn 
uh, like 65% of workers earn below min that earn below minimum wage are employed in food service and uh, food prep occupations. So this is an alarmingly low wage industry um, and it really does keep people in poverty. People that are in the industry experience poverty at the higher rates in the general workforce. They rely on public supports at higher rates in the general workforce um, and they sort of live this enduring life of economic instability. Um, and one of the reasons that that's even possible is that the restaurant industry is also the employer of the largest number of tip workers. And so in our country, uh, the federal wage laws state that if you earn more than $30 a month, a month in tips, that your employer can pay you a tip wage. And federally, that can be as low as $2.13. So in about 23 states across the country, including New Jersey, uh, tip workers who are nail salon workers, servers, bussers, delivery workers, valet drivers, et cetera, or valet workers, um, can earn as little, their employer can pay them as little as $2.13 an hour, which means that tips obviously are, you know, the majority of their income. Um, so, that's part of the reason why part of our policy priorities, or actually our core campaign, has been to pass what we call one fair wage. So it is essentially legislation that would move the subminimum wage, which is what we call the tip wage, uh, to eventually match the general minimum wage. So it's not asking for more than what a state already has, and it's a gradual phase in. So that sounds like a really simple ask, and it sounds like kind of a no-brainer considering that the base pay for the bulk of this workforce is $2.13. Um, but that's actually a really, really hard fight that we've had, and I'll get into that in a second. But as we started the fellowship, we, you know, we really wanted to explore the impact of tech on the workforce, um, and we began this at a moment where we felt a surge in the momentum around one fair wage. So 16 states introduced legislation to phase out the use of the sub-minimum wage, um, which was really exciting considering that historically no one really considers this workforce um, or sort of has this perception of it as a transient workforce or that tip workers are mainly servers who make tons of money because at one point, maybe in college, you worked at a bar and that's the perception that you carry. So this was actually really monumentous and we also are a part of two federal bills that um, we, one of them we expect will pass the house with one fair wage intact and that'll be the first time this has ever happened in the history of this work. Um, Okay, so as we engaged in the one fair wage campaigns, we saw that employers were really using the threat of automation as a way to thwart our organizing efforts. They were instilling a serious fear in workers saying that if you, um, you know, support one fair wage, a tablet is gonna take over your job as if literally the exchange ratio was one tablet to one worker. And so we wanted to take this time to explore, well, how are workers engaging with tech in the workforce? And we also were dealing a lot with misinformation, so I won't get into that now, but we also wanted to understand how people consume media and how they engage with media. Um, so we did a survey of over a thousand restaurant workers across the country. Uh, the, when we do research, we do participatory based research, which means we work with restaurant workers to collect surveys. So the bulk of these were collected through our membership. Um, and we found that, uh, you know, that the tablets were already here. The tablet takeover had already happened. People were already engaging with this in their workforce. Um, and it, the industry was still growing. So that was something that was a bit sort of startling to see, considering the hysteria that the industry managed to sort of arise while we were having these policy campaigns. So we found that 54% of restaurant workers reported that they, uh, their management used scheduling software. So people were reliant on algorithmic management. Um, but we also found that 90% uh, of workers reported that their management actually considered their scheduling consideration. So that was something that was really relieving to hear. But considering that if you're dependent on tips, you likely want to work weekends uh, and evenings, it probably, you know, it's probably what most people requested. Um, we also found that 13% of workers reported that their restaurant have self-ordering kiosks. And this was predominantly in quick serve, quick serve segments, so McDonald's, et cetera. We found that 14% of workers reported having table-side tablets in their workforce. Um, and the majority of those workers were in places like Applebee's, what we call casual dining. So not necessarily surprising, because when you go to those places, you see the tablets all the time on the table. So about half of the respondents that said they had tablets uh, were from that sector. Um, we also 
realized that the people that had tablets had some sort of quota that they had to meet uh, for customer surveys. So while you know a good majority didn't have to have any surveys filled out, a significant number had either to meet an, a quota every shift or meet one every week. Um, and this you know becomes alarming because the uh, the results are sometimes often used to influence the number of hours that you get, influence your schedule. Um, so we found that for many, many workers, more than we anticipated, uh, nearly half, they, they said that the results of their survey somehow influenced uh, their schedule. Uh, so I'm going to zoom through the rest of this. But mostly what we saw was that tech was already penetrating the industry. It had been for decades. And that sort of management was, or that employers were largely also using tech to add new revenue streams, to have customer loyalty programs. Um, you know, the majority have online ordering or delivery programs. And so we really realized that the threat of automation, what it really did was sort of magnify these existing uh, insecurities about economic stability. Um, so it really sort of manifested this power imbalance that existed in the workplace. And so, you know, I'll wrap up soon because I think my time is done. But I think one of the core takeaways that we found was that conversations about tech and the future of work really, really do have to center uh, or begin with reflections on already existing like workplace inequalities. And I didn't get into this whole second half, but you know, we really find that the restaurant industry, it began in the late 1800s and the tip wage itself is a vestitude of slavery. Newly freed slaves were the first tip workers. They were the sleeping car porters. They were working in restaurants um, and that to understand why the wage has been able to continue for over 130 years since the advent of this work and why workers have really only experienced a half a cent increase in the last 130 years, you really have to understand that what underpins this is racism and sexism, and that the, the sort of continuation of the tip wage also relies on that. So we really want to echo that that's one of the things that we realize is that there's a really strong need to reflect on the current imbalances in the workplace to understand the future of work.